So, John chapter 20. Here we are. Um, can, I, can I throw out just a couple, like, well, this one thing, maybe, from John 19 before we move forward? It's like a little thing, but we were so long last week, I just, I didn't, I didn't want to push it. But, like, did anybody notice... Um, when Jesus, right before it was all finished, he said, you know, I thirst. And they give him the, the sour wine. And, and what does John say they use as the delivery mechanism to get the sour wine to the mouth of Jesus? Hyssop. Hyssop. Did anybody think that was odd whenever you first read that? Like an odd detail, right? Why hyssop? And I'm, I'm pretty sure, like, the, the, synop- the other Gospels... Um, maybe one or two of them might, but I don't think that's like a universal thing that they point that out, that, oh, by the way, it was, it was a stock of hyssop. Um, so here's a fun thing you can do. Whenever you see an interesting word like that, you can do a search, and this is so easy to do today because of technology. You can do a search of when is the first time that word is used in the Bible, And then just look and see, is that a significant moment in the story of the Bible? And if so, it's like, is the author, by using this word, trying to get me to think about this other moment and connect these two scenes in my mind? And just ask that question. Sometimes the answer will be, oh, yeah, like, definitely. And sometimes like, eh, no, it doesn't quite fit, and you move on. Um, or you pray about it and come back to it again some other time, and suddenly you see something new. But, But so, like, hyssop, does anybody know... The first time the word hyssop appears in the Bible. What, what book of the Bible do you think it appears in? Exodus. Exodus. What chapter in Exodus? Twelve. Is it, you know the verse? Twenty-two. Close. Close. You had like one of the numbers. Right. right. So let's just see. Let's just do what I just said. Let's test that and see if that turns up anything. Sometimes it won't. Um, sometimes you strike gold. Um, so I'm just going to pick up at verse 21 because that's the start of a paragraph. So Exodus 12, in case you don't know, Exodus 12 is this really strange chapter um, as you're reading through the Exodus story, which is like really exciting and like the special effects budget is like over the top, like cool stuff has been happening and all of these like these plagues and judgments that have been coming on Egypt and you're just like <coughs> nail biting, like the narrative is super intense it's moving fast-paced exciting this back and forth between moses and pharaoh and yahweh speaking um and then you hit exodus 12 and like all of the action stops and it's like instructions on how to have a passover dinner party for you and all your friends and it's like literally like all the instructions on how you do this how you host this meal and it's like it's so odd and then the after right after the story picks up again and it's exciting right um but these this is a really important chapter (laughs) Uh, in the story of Israel and God's people. And uh, this meal that they're about, that they eat in this chapter and they're given instruction for becomes so, so important. Uh, But here's part of the instructions for that meal. Verse 21, then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop. This is the first time the word appears. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in blood that's in the basin, and then touch the lintel and the two doorposts, this is of your homes, with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. Why? Because Yahweh will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and the two doorposts, Yahweh will pass over, that's where the gets its name Passover, it will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. And you shall observe this right as a statute for you and your sons forever. So the first time we see hyssop, it's used, you you dip it in a basin, and what's on the end of that hyssop? Blood, and then it's touched to the doorposts and, and of the home, right? It's, it's part of the frame of the house, 
and, and when God sees the blood on the, the doorposts, he's going to pass over and he's not going to allow the destroyer to touch the family that is in the shelter of that home that's been touched by the blood. So Jesus is hanging on some piece of wood, right? And the hyssop is used to dip into what? Wine. And as John's gospel have wine and blood been a kind of mixed metaphor for one another, right? Dipped in the wine and then touched to what? To the cross itself or to what? To Jesus. It's touched to Jesus, to his lips. And so there. So I'm not going to talk any more about that. That was last week. But I've just thrown that out there. Think about that, the ramifications of that, what that's saying. What John is trying to say with that one word of just saying hyssop, pointing out that it was a hyssop stalk, what he's saying about what was happening in that moment and what, what Christ was securing for us and, and protecting and saving us from in that moment. Okay. So John chapter 20. So, you know, we've done this thing where we pointed out way, way early, nine months ago, <laughs> that the first seven days in John's gospel line up with the last seven days in John's gospel. Day five is, is, is the crucifixion day, and in the first, in John chapter one, the end of John chapter one, that's the day where, you know, Jesus is first called the king of Israel, where he says, you know, the son of man will be lifted up, and you'll see like heavens open and the angels ascending and descending upon him. Um, he'll be the place where, you know, heaven and earth touch, all of that lines up with uh, day five. And so then day six, because we just kind of skip over, because we know that, that this happens on, you know, right before the Sabbath, so the fifth day um, of the week that he's counting down. Um, and then chapter 20 says, now on the first day of the week, so now we're on the day after the Sabbath, so we skip over day six. Nothing happens in the last seven days on day six. What happened on day six in the first seven days? So if we flipped over, like, to the end of John chapter one, right? He, he makes this um, amazing claim, you know, you'll see heaven open and angels, God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And so then we go straight to chapter two. And when does chapter two, when does the story pick up? What does it say? What's the first verse of chapter two? On the third day, we just skipped day six. We just jumped straight to day seven. Nothing happens on that day. Wow, John has telegraphed that from the first chapter. Like, yeah, we're, we're not doing anything here. Um, it's a big question mark. What's going on there? And then we jump straight now to day seven. And so on the first seven days that John lines out, that, that's a really important day, right? So what happens on day seven, so this would be John chapter two, there's a really important thing that happens here. What is that? Do you remember? What, what, it's a, there's something happening on that day. It's a wedding. It's a wedding. It's a wedding day. There's a wedding day happening on day seven. What's a wedding? That's when a bride and groom, right, are pledge their vows. They are united. They start a new life together as, as the two have now become one, right? That's a big deal. Um, and is this just like an ordinary Jewish wedding or does something special happen at this wedding? Something special happens at this wedding, right? What was it? Water. Right, the water to wine, which is the first sign. It's sign number one happens on this day. And it's, it's you know, water, you know, becomes wine and not just any wine right it's not sour wine it's really really good wine it's super delicious wine it's the best wine that uh, the master of the ceremony had ever had and so with all of this happening on day, on day seven in john chapter two like we have been set up if we're like been a careful reader like something good better happen now in john 20 because john 19 was rough it was rough. Um, and so what's, what's going to happen in John 20, and how does that parallel and intersect with this picture that John has set for us in John chapter 2? And we're going to find that out now. Okay. So it's the first day of the week, 
and we're told Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Now, John, again, John's like leaving out a lot of details. He probably knows you have the Gospel of Mark or some other account of Jesus. So he doesn't need to explain to you, well, why was there a stone there? And what was going on? Like, he just, like, he's just skipping all that. Like, let's get to the good stuff. So this, there's a stone, apparently, and it's taken away from the tomb. And it's, it's still pretty dark. And so she runs in verse 2, and she went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, which one? The one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Now, who's the we? Who's the we there? So if you've read the other gospel accounts again, you know that it was, was did Mary go to the tomb by herself, or were there other women that went? There was other women there. And so some people are like, what's wrong with John's gospel? Like, he's got his facts wrong. There was other women there. He's not worried about what, that there are other women there or not. He's really focused on Mary Magdalene because she's about to have a moment. And so he's just zeroed in. It's like the other people that were there have faded out, faded into the background. And it's like the camera has focused in on Mary for a moment because she's going to become very important um, in the following scene. And so she's saying, like, we don't know. We can't, we can't find Jesus. So Peter went out with the other disciple and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first, which I, again, I think is another point in favor of the theory that the apostle John was a young guy and the young guys outrun old guys every time. And so, um, and stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he didn't go in. He just, he stooped and he looks in. So it's like this kind of a little cave area and there's some kind of a, a bench or something where they would have laid the body out. Um, and normally how, like the Jewish burial customs, you know, they would take the body and they would wrap it in this linen and they would add spices and, and wrap and add spices and wrap it. And then they would take a body and they would put it in the tomb. And there's a covering that they would do over the head. And then they, they'd seal it up and they'd leave it there for a period of time. People often wonder like, like, what, what, what was the purpose of the stone and rolling with the stone and opening the stone? They would leave it in there for a time for the body to fully decompose and they would come back to it after it had fully decomposed and they would then take the linens, they would collect the bones and they would put the bones in a, what's called like a bone box and then that's what they would store like permanently until the resurrection, the, the remains of that person. And so it was a way to allow the, the natural decom decomposition of the body happen in a place that was sealed away and safe from animals and scavengers and all of that, um, and then come back later. And so that's, that's how it was supposed to work. They come in, and what do they know for sure? Well, pretty sure when they, when they look in there is that did somebody just steal the body, the dead body? Probably not, because who would take the time to, to unwrap all of that, to take a, a corpse out, right? It's, real, it's a really odd thing to find how, and how they were just sort of lying there. And so like, again, this is all wrapped up. So if they would be, be unwound, you'd think it to be like in a scattered pile, kind of strewn everywhere. If you've ever like toilet papered somebody's house, like that's kind of mess that it would leave if you try to unwind this linen wrap body. But instead it's just like, lying there, which is really bizarre, and it's setting us up to wonder, like, it's almost like, you know, the body just passed through the cloth somehow. But the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, was not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself, like somebody took the time to just neatly, like, fold it up, and I don't need that anymore. Like, that's interesting. Um, and then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, by the way, because he was so much faster, also went in, and then look at this, this really short but powerful statement, and he saw and believed. He saw and believed. He, he, he looked at what was before his eyes, the evidence that was there, and very quickly came to the conclusion that, one, Jesus' body has not been stolen by someone but that something else has happened, something supernatural. And in that moment, 
I believe he's saying like he believed that the Lord has risen now. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. And then the disciples went back to their home. So, so the disciple that Jesus loves, he gets it, but everybody else isn't quite getting it. And he's not saying anything yet. He sees and believes. He believes, but he's not quite sure what he believes. But he doesn't believe that Jesus is just his corpse has been stolen. And so they go back to their home. Meanwhile, Mary, again, remember we, we zeroed in, we, the camera focused in on Mary. Mary is standing still outside the tomb, weeping, weeping. And, you know, as I try to, like, you know, imagine this scene, you know, they come back out, you know, Peter's bewildered. We know from some of the other Gospels it says that, you know, he was just, he didn't know what to think. He was just confused by this whole situation. So there's Mary outside the tomb, sobbing. Maybe he puts a hand on her shoulder, you know, whatever. But they don't stay with her. They just leave. They go back. They leave her there crying. And so finally, after they leave, you know, it was really dark when she got there at first. If she had wanted to look in the tomb, you probably wouldn't have seen anything. You're looking into a cave. The sun hasn't even come up yet. It's just pitch black. Now maybe the sun is coming up. There's a bit of light. And now finally, she wants to see for herself what the inside of this tomb looks like. And she looks in. And what does she notice? It's not the linens. Right? What does she notice suddenly? She sees two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet, which is really interesting. Do I want to go there? Yeah, I might as well. So, two angels, why is there two angels there, one on each side like that? Is there anything important in, in, um, you know, Jewish theology and their history and their interactions with God, where you ever had a picture of two angels on either side of something? Right, right, the, the cherubim, right, on either side of the ark and then the big statues that were there in the Holy of Holies. And what were they um, on either side of uh, symbolically? Like the ark itself was sort of seen as the footstool of God, like the Holy of Holies was sort of superimposed with the heavenly throne room of God, like they overla- it was overlapping spiritual space, right? And the Ark of the Covenant was, was like his footstool. It was like the idea that his feet were resting there. But then above the Ark, above the wings of the cherubim, it says that's where the Lord's throne was, where he was seated. They didn't make that with human hands, but they visualized that spiritually God's throne was there and that there were also like two angels sitting on either side of that. And interesting, we have this picture now in the tomb. The the, the tomb now looks like the Holy of Holies? That's really weird. Okay. And they say to her, woman, why are you weeping? Which can seem a little callous, right? But like, think about it. Like, what they're, they're challenging her. They're like, this is not the time for you to be crying. You should be having a human being. What is wrong with you? You should be having a different emotional response right now to what you're seeing. Why are you crying? Why are you sad? Right? And she says to them, they've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they have laid him. And, you know, the angels and, you know, John's gals, they don't give any response to that. Maybe they look at each other like, what's her problem? And having said this, she turned around, maybe she hears something, and she saw Jesus. But, ooh, get this. She saw Jesus, but she did not know that it was Jesus. So right away, John's led, like, this is this Jesus, the same Jesus, but it's not. There's something different about this Jesus. There's something about him that you don't necessarily instantly recognize him. And we see the same thing happen with the the disciples that are on the road to Emmaus in in the Gospel of Luke, where they they walk a whole journey with him, and they're talking about him to Jesus. Like how sad it is that Jesus died, and they have no clue that they're talking to the Lord. There's something interesting happening here, and you know, you can read, you know, what, what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians about the resurrected body, and and try to take from that, like, what, 
What is, what is it with this new body that Jesus has? But it's interesting, though, because there is a continuation, right? It's not as if there's an, an old, a dead corpse in the tomb, and now Jesus just has a brand new body. There's a continuation. The old body has been replaced fully and completely by this new body. And this new body doesn't seem to have to behave according to the rules of the old body. Rules like you have to take your linens off before you can get up off. Because remember, you think about, we have, and we have to contrast this because John just set it up so perfectly. We have to contrast this with Lazarus, right? Because when Lazarus was resurrected, he was resurrected in the same old body he had before. And when he came up out of the tomb, what did he look like? Like a, like a mummy, he was all wrapped up, he couldn't get the thing off his face. Like Jesus is like, help him. Like, come on, guys. Like, stop, pick your jaws up off the floor and go help the guy, right? But with Jesus' resurrection, it's not like that at all. It's so clean and tidy, and it's just, everything's just lying there neatly. There's something different here. It's, and John's really trying to communicate with these little details that this, this re, the resurrection and, and the resurrected body do, are, do not belong to and are not according to the rules of the old. Even though there is, there is a continuation in the sense that it's, it, the seed of the old body becomes you know, the raw material of the new body in some sense, because there's nothing left of the old body. But the new body is new, unique, different, right? And he starts off, he says the same thing um, that the angel said. He said, woman, why are you weeping? Like, and then he says, but he adds to it, whom are you seeking? Who are you looking for? Right here. Like, why are you crying? Right? She doesn't know who he is. Says, supposing him to be the gardener. Oh, he keeps reminding us over and over again. Where is this scene taking place? In a garden. Are, is there any significant stories that happen in the Bible in a garden? Oh my goodness, we're back to the garden, right? And it's interesting because in John's narrative, these whole last three days, right, this, this, the, the turning point in the story where things started to get really, really bad, really, really fast, started on day five in the early morning, uh, late at night, however you want to look at it, um, in a garden, right, the Garden of Gethsemane. That's where he was arrested, right? Starts in a garden and then ends in a garden. He, but he has to go through the, the cross, he has to go through death, and come out the other side, and now he's in a garden again. But this isn't the same garden as the first garden. Like You see like all of these wild things that like John is like getting us to think through that, and think what this means, and to see Jesus um, way, way before Paul would ever write this by the Spirit, that, that Jesus is the new Adam. He's the new Adam, and he's come through, and he has paid the price for humanity seizing what was forbidden to us from the tree by hanging on a tree himself, and has restored to us what was denied to us, which was access to the tree of life. And all, all of this, which is the resurrection, yeah, so... She supposes him to be a gardener. And so she says to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. It's just so amazing, right? Like, she's just like, whatever you've done, like, don't worry about it. Like, I'm going to take care of him. Like, just to have his body back. You know, we've talked, you know, earlier, you know, just a little bit ago about the impact of, of seeing Jesus' death must have had on, on Mary and, and the Apostle John and the others, not, not just those who, were, who knew intellectually what had happened to him, what was happening to him, but those that actually stood there and witnessed the whole event from start to finish, that just the raw emotion and the, the unending, like the grief and, and her need just to just have his body, if nothing else. And so Jesus says to her, look at this. So she sees Jesus. She sees him, but she doesn't recognize him. Pay attention. What's the trigger that she suddenly does recognize him, though? He says her name. When he calls her name. Does that make you think of what J John 10, my sheep, I know my sheep, and my sheep know my voice, and I'm going to call them by name? 
right? He just says, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. And he runs to her. And then we have, I'm not making this up. I read this this week. One of the most difficult verses in the New Testament to try to make sense of. He says to her, and I'm reading from the ESV. I'm really curious to see what other people have. He says to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. So that first thing where he says, do not cling to me in the ESV, what, what are some other translations that you guys have out there? Do not hold me. Okay, do not cling to me. Do not hold me. Don't touch me. That's pretty harsh, right? Don't touch me. What's going on with that, right? What's up with that? And, and why does he say that? Like, because he gives a reason why he's giving whatever he's saying to her. The reason for it is because he's not yet ascended to the Father. And instead, what he wants her to do, instead of clinging to him or holding him or touching him, he wants her to go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending or I'm in the process of ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And we'll see in a little bit that Jesus doesn't seem to have a problem with people touching him and his resurrected body pre-ascension to the Father, because he's going to invite somebody to totally put their hands on him and, and test if he's physical flesh and if his wounds are real wounds and all of that. So what's going on here with Mary? And, and what is, is Jesus uh, saying to her, right? Like, what's, what's really happening? And I think part of the key to it, by the way, is he's already seated it for us in John chapter 2. Because in John chapter 2, we have an interaction between Jesus and a different Mary where she wants something from him, and he's like, oh, it's not the right time. It's not the right time for that. It's my hour has not yet come. He wants to, because there's no wine. The wine's about to run out in the wedding, and it's got to be a really bad wedding. And, and, and she's like, Jesus, you need to do something about this. And he's like, it's not my time. But then she says to the servants, hey, whatever he tells you to do, do it. She has faith. And then he's like, okay. And he... He does the first sign, right? And this is, you know, we're on, we're on, the, on the other side. We're on the last seven, right? Um, and so here we have sign number seven, which is the resurrection, right? And we're not at a wedding. We're in a garden. Interesting wedding and gardens. And you think of a garden wedding that's happening, right? And there's this water to wine thing that happens um, that's initiated from a Mary, you know, imploring Jesus. And here we have kind of a, a clinging that's being asked for, that he's like asking her, like, yeah, let's please not do that. Um, and kind of the, there's a lot of different interpretations of, of this. Um, the, the sort of the most rational, um, just based, just purely on the text, is that Jesus is saying to her, look, um, I know you're super excited now. <laughs> your, your grief has turned to joy, but but there's, there's still more to be done. This isn't, the, and, and I need you to, I have a job for you. I have a mission for you. You need to go and tell the guys what's happened. You've just been um, given very special revelation that needs to be shared. And if, and if you stay here with me, you can't go and tell them. So it means even though it's going to be hard, you need to let go of me right now, and you need to tell others that are grieving just the way you were a second ago and turn their grief to joy by announcing to them the good news. Which is interesting because Mary Magdalene essentially in John's gospel becomes the first missionary. She becomes the first evangelist. And it's a woman. And, and it's a woman, you know, depending on different church traditions, is not a woman of great character. But that Jesus specifically, he could have chosen anybody, but he chooses her to go and then be the first to announce his resurrection to his own disciples. Which is interesting because also in John's gospel, we have a similar scene in John chapter 4, where Jesus chooses a Samaritan woman of low reputation, and she's the first person in the gospel that he just plainly says, yeah, I'm the Christ, I'm the Messiah. 
And then she goes, she drops everything, the water that was so important to her to collect, and goes to her community, to her neighbors, to announce we found the Messiah. So this is now this, it's a repeat, it's a reflection, it's a, it's, a, it's a rhyming of this theme of Jesus choosing the, the people that are the most lowly in the eyes of the world, the least qualified, and especially selecting them to give them the most privileged jobs of all in announcing his, his, his kingship and announcing his, now his resurrection, announcing his new kingdom, his, the wedding, the, the starting over, the resetting of what went wrong in the garden, like all things now are gonna be made new and, and he chooses and uses a woman. And totally think that's, that's probably the most likely interpretation on that. I, I, the only thing I would add to it, and this is now, you're just getting into like Nasser's private thoughts with the Lord as I was reading this and reflecting on it with him. I just, and you know, test this with yourselves with, with the Lord in private, but I just, I, I, when I read this um, really prayerfully um, last week, I just felt the, the, the deep, passionate heart of the Lord for this woman for all of his children. And I just imagine that scene, like, I mean, you imagine someone you thought was dead, gone, you're never gonna see them again. And now they are alive, like really alive, like no one else you've ever seen. And she's holding on to him. And some people imagine she was like holding on to his feet. I like imagine she like just had her arms around him. And I can't imagine Jesus just standing there when someone's got their arms around him. You know, Jesus is a hugger, at least in my mind. And he's got his arms, and he's like, you got to let go. you got to let go, because I can't let go until you do. Like, you just have this, this feeling, like he was just like, oh, there will be a time, daughter, when we can stay like this forever. But I need you to let go of me for now, for now, and go and tell your brothers what has happened. I don't think it's a Jesus doesn't want to be touched by women, which some people have said. Uh, but I just see just the deep love of Jesus there and his longing. And again, but then his, at the same time, his obedience to the Father, because the job's not finished yet. He has not yet ascended and sat on his throne victorious in the heavenly places. And so it's not yet time for the love fest that we're going to have with him. There's still a job to do. There's one last thing to do, and that's falls to us now. His work is finished, and our work has begun. And Mary gets to be the first one to go and take up the mantle of telling the nations of what God has done. And she does it, just like the woman, the Samaritan woman, she hears it, she doesn't question it, she just goes and tells everyone she knows. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. And so on the evening of that day, it's the first day of the week, the doors being locked, and that's an important detail that John wants us to understand. The doors are locked. There's no way to get into this room. It's because the disciples had the doors locked because they were for, for fear of the Jews, because in their minds, like, Jesus was the first to fall, but somebody's still looking for the rest of them. Jesus came and stood among them. Remember, doors are locked. There's no way to get into the room. They're in hiding. And then suddenly, Jesus is there. This is going to be a theme for him. He's going to do this kind of thing a lot. And he says, peace be with you. Shalom Aleichem. Or as we say in Arabic, assalamu alaikum. And when he said this, he, like, apparently they didn't respond. They're just like, ah! And he shows them his hands and his side, which I guess you know, maybe they feel like he's a ghost, whatever, a vision. And then they're glad when they saw like, oh, wow, it's really him. Like, it's really him. And... Jesus said to them again, because they didn't respond apparently properly the first time, you know, peace be with you. Come on, guys, you know, and upon you be peace, right? As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, so I, my translation says he breathed on them, but really in the Greek it just says he breathed. It doesn't say he breathed on them, in them, said he breathed, like breathing a deep breath, and he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. 
If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Okay. So what do we do with this verse, right? Um, First of all, is John trying to do his own little mini retelling of Pentecost and what it looked like when the Holy Spirit fell on the disciples? Because this looks way different than Acts chapter 2, right? Way different. So uh, is that what's, what's happening here? It doesn't look like it. So what, what is happening here? What, why is John risking us getting confused about that by using this kind of language and saying this? So we've already talked about all of like coming off of day seven, um, and we're still in that day, they're in the evening of that day, and garden imagery and thinking about Genesis, chapter one, two, and three, and all of that. Is there a scene in that section in Genesis where God breathes on somebody? On Adam, right? He took the, the, the soil of the ground and he formed a man, but he wasn't really a man yet until he breathed on him the spirit of life and then he became a living creature, right? And so... Once the, I think what, what John is trying to show us, like in that room, for them, it was like it's being with the resurrected Jesus, it, it was like a big reset. We were back to the garden. It was a new humanity. And remember that, that when he did that, right after he did that with, with Adam and then you know, formed his wife out of Adam, and then he gives them this command, right, that they're going to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Right, and then have rain, have dominion, and all of that. But the, these, these first humans were going to become this nucleus of a new, ever-expanding humanity that was, had a, a, a command, a blessing, a mandate to multiply and fill the earth and cover the earth. And John is casting this moment as like a, a, another version of that, that from this nucleus of these 11 guys, or 10 guys, we're going to find out, uh, he has, has, are the seeds of a new humanity that's going to go out, that's going to be fruitful and multiply and spread and fill the earth in a different way, in a different way, right? Because these people are going to reproduce and have children spiritually in the sense that they're going to make disciples and invite people into the new life that they are now receiving from God. And so the really trippy part is where he says, you know, forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven. And if you withhold and like, what kind of strange teaching is that? Like, do we, does that mean we have the power to like send people to hell because we don't want to forgive them, right? You have to put it in context, right? He's, he's putting, saying this in the context of I'm sending you just as I was sent. And I'm sending you to announce you're going to receive the Holy Spirit before you go. And when you go and you're announcing what you have seen, what you have witnessed, your testimonies, you are offering them forgiveness. And and people that hear what you say, hear the forgiveness that you're offering through through this gospel that I'm giving you, they're going to be forgiven. And those that turn away, that turn their back on this gospel and and stand away from it, then, you know, they reject the forgiveness and the forgiveness is withheld. But what he's saying to them is he's given them an idea of the significance and the importance of the mission that he is sending them on. They now have, in a sense, you know, there's there's thousands and thousands and thousands of people out there just in the, the city that they're in right now that have the ability that could receive forgiveness, but won't receive forgiveness unless they go and tell them. That's an important, that's like heavy. That's a weighty thing. And you see why it's said in the same breath as you need to receive the Holy Spirit and do this. Because, man, that's too hard a job. I'm going to screw that up. 
If God tells me to go and, and try to represent him in a way that will draw people to him, that will be able to even understand the forgiveness that he's offering and not just reject it because I'm just a really bad messenger, right? I, I'm going to need God's personal presence with me and making the, um, the, the invitation through me to him. Like it's got to be his power and his presence in it and through it all and all and all. And that, that's what Jesus is offering to them in that room. But then we're told in the very next sentence, now Thomas, who was one of the 12, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord, but he said to them, unless I see his hands, see in his hands the marks of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Which is interesting, because now he's been set up. Um, and first of all, Thomas, Thomas gets a lot more screen time in John than he does in any of the other Gospels. And all the other Gospels, he's just one name listed with, and here's a listing of all the disciples, and Thomas is in the list. We never know anything about him, where he came from. He never gets any dialogue, no moments in any of the Gospels. In John, he gets a couple of moments. He's, he's the one that when Jesus decides to go to Jerusalem for the last time, Thomas is like, and everyone's like, let's not do it. Thomas is like, no, let's go with Jesus and die with Jesus. Like, he's a brave guy, apparently. He loves Jesus. And he's also the guy when they were at the Last Supper that Thomas and Jesus is explaining that he's going to the Father and, you know, you can't go now, but you'll go later. And Thomas is the one that's like, Jesus, how are we going to do that? We don't even know where you're going. We don't understand anything you're saying. Like, you know. We've gotten a little bit, uh, uh, just from those little scenes, a little bit, he's maybe, you know, uh, not necessarily as outspoken the way Peter is, but, you know, he, he, says, he says what's on his mind. He's honest. He's an honest guy. He's a passionate guy. We know that about him. But his, his uh, really extreme remark, like, I'm not going to believe until I put my fingers in the holes. So I'm going to put my hand up into him. I'm not, I will never believe. Versus, who have we told so far in this chapter, who has believed? The guy who's writing the story, the Apostle John, right? And he's being contrasted now with John. What kind of evidence did John need to believe? He just had to see the empty tomb. The empty tomb with the discarded linens, and that was enough for him to believe. But Thomas is going to need to see a little bit more than that. So what's, how is God going to deal with that? Some people need different levels of belief. Some people, and some people in this room, all you needed to do was hear an authentic, genuine presentation of the gospel, and you felt your heart strangely warmed, and you went and you gave your life to Jesus. Other people in this room maybe needed, you know, a visitation by an angelic being and a grand vision that lasted six hours and all kinds of other things um, in order, because they just weren't going to believe any other way. Um, and, and, and like, we wonder like, how do we make sense of that? How come like some people get like really wildly, you know, supernatural testimonies and other people it just seems so simple and, and is one more valuable than the other? Well, here we have this contrasted right in this very chapter between John and Thomas and how does the Lord deal? Like for what John saw was enough and that was good, right? And Thomas wanted a lot more. And how is, is the Lord, what's the Lord going to do? He actually gives it to him. It says eight days later. So that's just a nice way of saying one week later. So we're seven, another round of seven days passes. And Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, once again, locked doors, right? So they're still afraid of the Jews, which is why we think that, you know, when Jesus said, receive the Holy Spirit, he's talking about you will receive the Holy Spirit. Because this isn't the behavior of people that are anointed with power from on high, still hiding in their room with locked doors, right? And we see that in Acts, the huge change that comes over them once they do receive the Spirit. So they're still locked, hiding in lock, behind locked doors. Jesus comes, shalom aleichem, and <laughs> then says to Thomas, hey, I, I heard what you said before. Go ahead, put your, put your finger here and see my hands and, and put your hand and place it in my side. And then he says, do not disbelieve, but believe. Come on, Thomas, which is so like amazing. You know, the mercy, the grace of God. Thomas, is what Thomas asked for, 
Is that really a reasonable thing to ask of the Lord? Like, come on, that's really pushing it. Like, I think, you know, Gideon was a pretty bold guy in asking for signs from Yahweh, right? Okay, can you make the fleece wet and the grass dry? Now, can you reverse it? And, you know, and can you do a handstand? You know, I mean, just like just taking it to extremes. And yet Jesus is like, okay, I will. I love you that much. And I want you that much. I don't want you to miss out on what I have done for you is too important to quibble over these little things. Like, fine, go ahead, do it. If that's what it's going to take, but please stop disbelieving and believe in me. Receive the life that I want to give you, Thomas, because I hung on that cross as much for you as I did for John. And if it's going to take more for you to come to me, so be it. I'll give you more so that you come to me. Whatever I got to do to get you to come to me. But you have to make the choice no matter what I show you. And you notice that. Like, Jesus let, makes sure that Thomas knows that Thomas has to make the choice no matter what signs Jesus gives him. The onus is on Thomas to decide if he's going to be a believer or an unbeliever. And Jesus knows that sometimes signs and wonders aren't enough for people. People can have dreams of Jesus their whole lives. I know of people in the Middle East who have seen, you know, the, the quote-unquote man in white. They know it's Jesus. They'll tell you it's Jesus. He has se- they've seen him in dreams for years. And they have not left the religion of their birth to follow Jesus. They just, they, they count the cost and it's too high. Or it just, just, the story seems too good to be true. Or any number of reasons. But signs are not enough. Every person has to choose for themselves if they'll follow Jesus or not. And Thomas, what does Thomas choose? It's not left ambiguous. He says, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, he's not saying that Thomas isn't blessed. This is like one of those beatitudes. There's not, only a couple of them in John. But what Jesus is saying, it's, I'm, it's good. You saw and you believed, and that's good. I'm glad that this, that was enough for you, finally. But he's, like, he's like letting Thomas and the disciples there know, and John, the Apostle John, is letting us know 2,000 years later. And as much as we might want and wish if only we could have been there and seen all this ourselves and experienced all this firsthand, right? But, but Jesus is speaking through the page to us and says, but you know what? There's a special blessing for you who haven't seen all these things with your own eyes, but you receive them totally by faith, totally by hearing the character, the love of God that we see in Jesus and saying yes to him saying yes to him, that there is a special blessing for those that the people that were there back then didn't, don't, don't get. They don't get what we get. And that's sort of a weird thing. But Jesus says it's a better thing. It's a better portion. And then we have, you know, the sudden ending. So he says that, right, which just seems like a good way because the, the Jesus and, and the, John, the author, kind of speaking not quite breaking the fourth wall, but, but a little bit speaking to us, saying, you know, guys, like you who are reading the story, you need to make a choice now too, just like Thomas. Are you going to remain an unbeliever or are you going to believe? And you've got to make the choice. And, and you didn't get to see this stuff with your own eyes the way these people did, but there's a blessing waiting for you if you choose to believe having not seen these things yourself. And then John closes the story with, now, Jesus did many other signs, now, how many signs did we get in, in this um, gospel? We got seven signs, right? And then, but there were others. There were more than seven guys, but I picked seven. Um, and they're not written in this book. Sorry. <laughs> you don't get to know about those. Um, but these are written. The seven that I chose, they were written specifically for this purpose, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And that's really interesting. It's kind of a fun um, 
experiment to go through the, the seven signs of John, the, the water to wine, the healing of the lame man, the healing of the, the boy that was at the point of death, the feeding of the 5,000, the, the healing of, of the, uh, the blind man, the, the resurrection of Lazarus, and then finally Jesus' own crucifixion and glorious resurrection. And take each one of those signs and say, how does this sign, this story, this scene present to me the truth about who, that Jesus is, really is the Messiah and all that that means? that he really is also the Son of God, the incarnation of Yahweh, and that by believing him, we're going to have life in him. That's all of those seven that were chosen by John. He tells us they were chosen to, to, with that agenda, with that, that uh, communicating that idea. So to take all of those and reflect individually all seven of these signs, and, and how does this communicate to me who Jesus is and what I might receive if I were to put and trust my life in his hands? And that's, that's how the book ends. But wait, there's more, right? And we'll, we'll tackle that next week because John was the original creator of the post-credit scene. And seriously, so that's like the ending and a lot of like, people wonder, like, oh, John 21 was tacked on by someone else. I don't think so. I think he was just really cool. Um, and so like, he, he ends his story, but then like, you think, okay, and that's the end. And then he gives you one last really poignant scene, which is very powerful. And then he gives, goes back to the credits, and the story is over. Um, and we'll talk about next week why that is and, and why, you know, what, what's going on here, what's so important that you don't just stop the book there. Because you could, right? This is a legitimate ending. You could end the story there. And so we'll talk next week why he doesn't, why he chooses to continue the story just a little bit further and, and wrap up this crazy journey through the Gospel of John.